My son Corbin says that title package always makes him dance. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's been a long time. I've been preaching to nobody for about 10 weeks. Um, so uh, for those of you in the room, here's what we need to do. You need to help me remember that I'm not preaching to nobody anymore. So um, if I say something you agree with, you can feel free to say yes or amen. If I say something you don't understand, you can say, what's he talking about? Um, but just let me, know that, let me know that you're here. And those of you who are watching at home, wherever you are, you can get in practice of this too. I might not be able to hear you, but you know, go ahead and throw your voice behind it. Uh, we are concluding this series today with a bang. It's a bonus week. We weren't originally planning on doing this, uh, but we decided we needed to do this. We're talking about um, the kind of topic of topics when it comes to controversy or questions. We're talking about politics all on a weekend where we are reopening church for live worship. A lot going on. And here's what I want to say. Here's the truth about politics. Politics is now and always has been our true great pastime as Americans. Long before there was baseball, there was politics, and we have been captivated by them from the very beginning. And, and I know we still like our sports, right? We've got um, all kinds of networks and media empires devoted to sports, and we spend a lot of money on sports, and, and sports are what often takes ordinary men and women and turns them into celebrities and millionaires. <laughs> but you can say all the same things about politics, right? I mean, we invest a lot of money in politics. It's a big money industry. Lots of media empires built around politics. And once you get to the big stage, no one retires from politics poor. And yet, unlike baseball, politics is still the one thing that we're not supposed to talk about in church, which normally I agree with. I I don't find it to be very helpful to get political in church. But today we're making an exception, and here's why. Because if you look around at the world today, it does not appear to be helpful that we have left politics unaddressed from a faith perspective. And what I'm talking about is I'm talking about the deep divisions that exist in some of our households along political lines, or the divisions that exist in our churches on political lines, even denominations that take their identity not from theological differences, but on the basis of political differences. And here we are in an election year, and it's only going to get worse, right? And so it's about time. Thank you. You you heard me earlier. Yep, that's right. Um, It's only about to get worse in an election year. And so we need to shed God's light, God's wisdom as much as we can on this very divisive issue. And not only that, what we're going to see today is that talking about politics from a faith perspective is biblical. There is, there is a precedent. See, one day, two groups of people came together to ask Jesus a question. And what's interesting about Jesus' ministry is that a big part of Jesus' ministry is just answering questions that people came up and asked him. Uh, people asked him questions and he, and he would teach about something. And so even the way we're doing the series, the format of the series, has some precedent. But these two groups of people were groups that didn't often affiliate with each other. One of them uh, were a group of people called the Pharisees. How many of you have at least heard that name before, Pharisees? Yeah, uh, the Pharisees were the religious rulers, the religious elite. They were legalist, very black and white, very by the book, didn't have a lot of grace or love in their hearts. Jesus called them hypocrites. They did not like Jesus. We hear a lot about the Pharisees in the Bible. The other group that came along with the Pharisees to ask this question to Jesus was a group called the Herodians. Herodians. We know a little less about them, but one thing we do know is that they were kind of a political group. They were Israelite people, but they felt loyal to the Herods. Now, the Herods were this dynasty of so-called Israelite kings, but they were really puppet kings placed by Rome. So most Israelites resented them because they weren't authentic kings placed by God. They were placed by the Roman emperor, but the Herodians were loyalists to the Herods. They liked the Herods. They were supportive of them. So these two groups of people came together. And this is how you know you're in trouble. When two groups of people who don't like to talk to each other, when, when you know, two friends from school, two coworkers who don't even have anything to do with each other, when they join forces to come and to, to pick a bone with you, you know you're in trouble. You know that old saying, nothing unites like a common enemy. 
When these two groups show up at your door, that's how you know they found their enemy and it's you. But today, uh, the case, as the story goes, it's actually Jesus. And uh, I want you to see how it all plays out. It's coming from Matthew chapter 22. It says, then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap Jesus in his words. So they sent their disciples kind of incognito to him along with the Herodians, these two groups of people who didn't really see eye to eye on much. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Now this is rich, right? These two groups who don't see eye to eye on anything say, teacher, we know you are impartial. You don't say one thing to one crowd and say something to another crowd. You don't placate or pander. Just give us a clear yes or no, teacher. And then they ask him the most politically divisive question of their day. Good teacher, is it right for a Christian to vote for someone who supports abortion? No, that wasn't their question. That's one of ours though, isn't it? <laughs> or teacher, is it right to vote for a candidate who does not do anything to help refugees or immigrants on the border? Again, one of our questions. Teacher, is it right for a Christian to vote for someone who's not even a Christian? Now, I could go all morning. We have all kinds of questions like this that are important to us and also deeply divisive questions. But that's not the question that these two groups came to Jesus to ask. They came to ask another question. Let's look at it. Uh, tell us then, teacher, since you're so impartial and you're not going to give us a political answer, you're just going to say the truth, nothing but the truth, the whole truth. What is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? So here it is, the most... Um, divisive question of the day and as you see that word imperial tax if you heard Star Wars music playing in the background you are right on because what this was is this is not just a question about is it right to pay taxes to the government the imperial tax was a special tax levied not on Roman citizens but on Roman subjects so Rome is the great empire and if you're an Israelite person, if you're a Jewish person living in this day, that means that Rome came into your land to occupy your land. They're, they're living in your land. They take control of your nation. They establish puppet kings in authority over you. They, they harass your people with their soldiers. They make you obey their laws. And you get no rights. You get no privileges from any of that. But as a sincere sign of your deep appreciation for all that Rome has done for you, which is nothing, you get to pay the special imperial tax. This was an especially hated tax. This was a let's dump all the tea in the harbor right now kind of tax. And they come to Jesus to ask this question because there is no good answer to this question. If he says, no, that's an immoral tax. I mean, this is ridiculous. Taxation without representation. They're going to go tell Caesar they'll kill Jesus on the spot for treason. And if he sides with the tax, if he says, yeah, pay the tax, then he's a traitor in the eyes of all of his countrymen. There is no good way to answer the question. But Jesus knows this. He knows it's a trap. And instead of evading the trap, it's interesting, Jesus wades right into very difficult political waters. And as he does, he says something so profound, so important, so lasting, that it's still relevant to us 2,000 years later as we wrestle with our own political questions and our own political divisions. I want you to see what Jesus says, how he responds. He says, Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Tell you what, show me the coin used for paying the tax. And they brought him a denarius. A denarius was a coin, uh, it was the equivalent to what probably a day laborer would get. So at the end of your day of hard labor, you'd get a denarius. That's kind of what was used to pay the tax. And he asked them, whose image is this on the denarius and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. Now, 
This is extraordinary to me. Not only did Jesus wade into these waters, very murky waters, different sides of people or different people on different sides of the issue. Not only do they leave him alone, he survives by the answer that he gives, but they leave amazed. And I read this and I go, okay, but what was so amazing about his response? Was it the simplicity of his answer? Now, it's probably not lost on you that Jesus possesses lots of gifts and abilities that I don't possess. (laughs) One of them is something called brevity. He gave simple answers to very complex questions. One time an expert in the law said, "Uh, teacher, of all the commandments, there were 613 commandments in the Old Testament, of all the commandments, which is the most important? I'd need about five minutes of preamble just to like give disclaimers to everything before I answer the question, as you will see today. Um, And yet Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. Mic drop, you know? That's it. Hear this question. He answers in such a simple way. Is is that what was amazing? That Jesus could talk about really complicated things with simple truths. Or was it so amazing that Jesus' answer acknowledges the gray in life? All those gray areas in life, which frankly is hard for us to do to acknowledge that there's great, especially those of us who are religious teachers. In the run-up to the question, you kind of heard it. You know, you say the truth, you give it to us black and white, you just tell, us to, tell it to us straight, Jesus, and, and there's kind of this expectation that religious leaders will be black and white, will be we, they, will be binary, will be very clear by the book. And yet Jesus' answer acknowledges that there's a gray area. This imperial tax, it's going to support an immoral regime. I mean, the Romans demanded emperor worship. They harassed people. I mean, you're supporting the evil empire when you give this tax. And yet, if you don't pay the tax, they're going to throw you in jail or worse. And Jesus' answer kind of acknowledges this is a gray area. And his answer says, you know what? Do your duty and let God handle the rest. Pay the tax. That's what you can control. You can't control the rest. Uh, It's an answer that acknowledges the gray. Now, as a culture, I think we struggle with this more and more. We're living in a time of hyper-responsibility where we are obsessed with trying to control the downstream effects of all of our actions, aren't we? And so now, going to the grocery store, we go into a complete existential crisis when they ask us paper or plastic. Like, what do I do? If I say plastic, I've killed a sea turtle. If I say paper, I've melted part of the polar ice cap. And they won't even let me bring in my own bags anymore because of COVID. What am I supposed to do? Just carry out all the stuff in my arms and drop it in the parking lot. You know, like, what what am I supposed to do? We live in a sense of hyper-responsibility. And then you take it beyond just kind of that inane example. And you think about what's happening in Minneapolis and around the world right now in the wake of George Floyd's death and, and, and you hear people responding saying the only right moral response to this is to get out right now on social media and to cry racism and if you don't do that you're part of the problem and we say really is, is that the only way to respond to something tragic now in a tragic history in our nation are there other ways where people say if you go out in society for unnecessary reasons right now in this COVID epidemic, you are responsible for killing someone who is immunocompromised or elderly. And you think, wait, wait, really? Is it, is it really that black and white? Is it really that simple? For all of our rhetoric, we tend to live and to like to live with very black and white answers. And maybe what was so amazing about Jesus' answer is that it acknowledges that there is a gray area in life. There are things that are beyond our control. There there are things that are uncertain. Or um, maybe what was so amazing about his answer is that it's an answer that makes you ask a deeper question. So this famous phrase from Jesus that we just heard, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Leaves you asking a question, doesn't it? Okay. Okay. What is God's? I mean, the denarius belongs to Caesar. What is God's here? And if the denarius belongs to Caesar because it bears his image and inscription, what on earth bears the image and the inscription of God? Oh. 
I do. And so do you. Right? We bear the image of God. That's what Genesis says. God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created us male and female. He created us in his image. We bear the image of God. And not only that, we are the ones on whom God has inscribed his name. Isaiah 43 says, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your own name, but I've made you mine. In other words, I've called you by your name, but I've put my name on you. I've made you mine. I've inscribed my name on you. Or later on in Isaiah, I love this. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? I mean, by and large, we'd say, no way. I mean, something happens when you give birth to a baby and immediately you, you want to take care of it and you want to love it. God says back to us, though she may forget, though it's possible for that to happen, I will never forget you. Listen to this. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Not only has God inscribed his name on us, he's called us by name and then he's put his name on us, but God has taken our names and he's inscribed them on the palms of his hands which means that we are his and he is ours. It is mutual. And so while Caesar gets his coins, those are the things that bear his image and inscription. I'm the thing that bears the image and the inscription of God, so Caesar gets the coins, but God gets me. Yeah? But here's the big implication for us. Uh, and this is where this age-old wisdom can help us today. This is an imperative, a command from Jesus as we navigate our own divisive political issues. And, and I want you to take this heart to heart, especially in an election year. Here it is. Don't give Caesar more than his due. See, if, if we bear the image and the inscription of God, if Caesar gets the coins but God gets us, then don't give Caesar more than his due. Does Caesar have a claim? Absolutely. Does the political establishment require something of us? Yes. Does it mean something to be a good citizen? Absolutely. But we've got a nasty habit, even as Christians, of giving Caesar way more than he is obligated to receive, giving him way more than his due. We love to give Caesar more than he requires. See, whenever we let political affiliations divide families, when parents and kids no longer talk to each other, or, or siblings no longer talk to each other because they vote for different people, they have different political ideologies, we have given Caesar more than his due. He should not have the power to divide flesh and blood families. Or when we let Caesar decide and political affiliations decide who we will be friends with or who we will converse with or who we will invite to sit at our dining room table, we've given Caesar more than his due. When we let our identity mirror a party platform or when we let Republican, Democrat, Green, Libertarian become like a hallmark of our identity, we've given Caesar way more than his due. We, we, we can believe things, but those should not become who we are. We, we shouldn't let Caesar give us labels like that. When we look to the government to solve the world's problems, we've given Caesar more than his due. The government can't solve the world's biggest problems. There, there is only one that we put our hope in. And, and, and speaking of hope, if we allow ourselves to fall into either elation or despair for an entire four-year period based on who gets elected, that's how we know we've given Caesar more than his due. And, and I'm not saying, again, that you shouldn't care about politics, you shouldn't have passionate viewpoints, you shouldn't be informed. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be a good citizen. I'm not saying that you shouldn't vote. I'm not saying that you shouldn't serve your country. Nothing greater than laying down your life for your friends. I'm definitely not saying that you shouldn't pay your taxes because you know they're always listening. <laughs> so pay your taxes, right? Give Caesar what is Caesar's. But we've gone beyond that. We've willingly given Caesar things that Caesar was never meant to have. And that's why now Trump and Biden are Democrat and Republican. And it doesn't mean so much to us when really it should mean something but very little. Because the truth of Jesus today is that bigger than anything else, 
We are people who bear the image and the inscription of God. And so Jesus has a bigger claim on us. And it's a good thing because Jesus is the one who's gonna solve the world's problems. And Jesus is the one who gives us ultimate hope. I've had elections where my person got elected and elections where they haven't. I'm not sure that I've been more or less hopeful about the world either way. Jesus is the one who gives me hope. And, And Jesus is the one who determines who I call family. Jesus is the one who tells me who should be invited to sit at my table. And he tells me that in his kingdom, in his reign, there is no Republican or Democrat. There's no tribe or nation. There is no slave or free, male or female, Greek or Jew. There are just people who've been washed in the blood of the lamb who I'm called to love. And I'm even called to love my neighbor who's far from God. He determines that. Jesus is my security. Jesus is my protection. Jesus gives me my identity. And I will never let a party platform give me that. I will never let even a country give me that. See? I'm, I'm proud to be an American. There's no country I'd rather live in, but before I'm an American, I'm a member of the family of God through Jesus Christ, and nations will rise, and even the greatest nations will fall. But Jesus' reign will never end, and so his claim on my life will never end. That means Jesus gets my true pledge of allegiance. He gets my heart and my soul and my mind. He gets the best of my passion and the best of my life and the best of my energy Because while Caesar gets my coins, I'm the one on whom the image and inscription of God rests, so so Jesus gets me. Now, now before I turn to your questions, and I know there are a lot of specific questions, this is just a framework, here's what I hope you know already, that when you pledge your allegiance to Jesus, what makes Jesus so different than any king or president or ruling authority is that when you give yourself over to him, he will never abuse you or your trust He will never squander or waste what you put into his hands. He will never diminish you. He will never steal from you. He will never deprive you of the things that bring true life and fulfillment. Instead, here's what Jesus does. He he blesses and enriches every part, piece, and morsel that we are willing to place into his hands. I love the way Paul puts it, and I just want to share this in closing. He says to the Corinthian believers, he says, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given to you in Christ Jesus. For in Christ, you have been enriched in every way. When you put yourself in the hands of Jesus, he will enrich you in every way. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift, any gift that really matters. You're you're not lacking anything that you really need as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. And he will also keep you firm to the end. He will enable you to persevere to the very end. And you won't be tripping to the finish line, gasping. But when you get there to the finish line, you will be found blameless because of his righteousness that covers you on the day that he reappears. No Caesar, no government can promise you that. Only Jesus can. That when you put yourself, when you put your trust, when you put your hope in his hands, He will not only take care of you, but he will enrich you in every way, which is why Caesar may get my coins or my my duty or my, my vote, but only Jesus gets me. I'm excited to take your questions. You can text them in. There's John. Hello, Dion. Are you, I could feel the energy just, I, did it's, you get a little excited because you had people? I know, right? It's I heard a couple of amens. People. I heard a few claps. So, yeah. you know, you're doing something right. I'm just glad to, to know that I wasn't alone. Well, this is our last Q&A. I'm excited. Remember, you can still text it in. This is actually genuinely live. So um, that's the number. And uh, let's just get started with uh, this question from Romans. So Romans 13.2 says, whoever rebels against the ruling authority is rebelling against what God instituted and they will be punished. What does this mean for protesting political power? That is a great question. Romans 13 is actually a chapter of of scripture that you should study if if you wanna wanna understand all of this. Um, Now, understand too that in Romans, we're talking about this empire that I just described. And Rome was, you know, a brutal dictatorship. It was a totalitarian kind of regime. Doesn't matter, you know, what what you read. I mean, it was was brutal. Um, And, and so it's kind of a different political situation than what we find ourselves in today. Um, you know, we're, we're in a democracy, our voice matters. Um, here's what's interesting about Romans though. 
Paul could say that this ruling authority, and I mean, the stuff that the Roman emperors did, I mean, they, they fed Christians to lions, they burned them at the stake, they put them in coliseums um, to, to be torn apart in front of spectators. They demanded worship of themselves. They built statues, demanded the whole empire to worship. I mean, you've never seen a political candidate. You've never voted for someone or, you know, refused to vote for someone as morally corrupt as the Roman emperors. And what's interesting about this, as as Paul says this, is, hey, all authority has been established by God. Which may feel at first weird, like, how could God establish such corrupt authority? Really, Really what Paul's saying is, before you get too panicked or worked up about the political authorities that are staring you in the face... Just remember that there is a God behind the throne who is really working everything out. He's, he's the one who's really in power. And so the, the Romans 13 tells us like, relax. Um, protesting in Romans 13 wasn't really an option. I mean, you just get killed. There was no, there was no you know, discourse, public yeah. discourse. Um, so for us, we are invited to speak into the process. We are invited to let our voice be heard. Really, our country should be run by the will of the people. That's part of what it means to, to be here in America for those of us who are Americans. Um, so we should, we should voice our concerns. That may include things like protesting when we think our country is off track. But, but we should do so with the same spirit that Paul talks about here in Romans 13. The spirit that understands that, yeah, we want our government to be as, as upright, as good as possible. But even if they're not... Even if we end up with leaders who are as corrupt as the Roman emperors, God's really behind all of this. And, and we can take a sigh of uh, relief knowing that it's not ultimately about the Caesars or the presidents. There is a God who is working things out behind the scenes for his people always and forever and his kingdom reigns forever. Um, so I, I think, yeah, protest, but don't protest as if what happens in the political realm is everything, it's not everything. There's, there's a God who's doing something behind the scenes and we, yeah, we gotta figure out how to live our citizenship out as earthly citizens, but we belong to a greater kingdom. Yeah, that's a helpful flip. I appreciate that. This is a longer question. Okay. So um, I don't understand the difference between moral values and politics, but Gen X and millennials consistently preach coexistence. How can I peacefully and in a godly way coexist without allowing for unfair, inhumane politics to prevail? There is a lot in that question. I know, it's a long um, Yeah, so I, I see the, uh, the coexistence thing. Um, so how can I peacefully and in a godly way coexist without allowing for unfair and human politics to prevail? Yeah, so I, I mean, I appreciate, bo- I appreciate all that's in this question. Um, we are called to live peaceably with our neighbors. Um, so this coexistence thing is not necessarily a bad thing um, from a faith standpoint, um, but also, you know, certainly from a civil realm. We're, we're to be a country where people of all different kinds of viewpoints can live together and get along. Um, so coexistence is a, is a good thing. Um, again, I'm, I'm not sure what unfair and human politics are being mentioned here in specific, but I'm sure we all have our conceptions of what those things might be. Um, I think what I just said about we should advocate for what's right, what we believe is fair, what we believe is just. We're called to have a voice. We should also do so in a way where we have humility, mm-hmm. where we don't take ourselves too seriously. And we don't think, and I think this is the hard thing about living in a, in a republic or a democracy, we think we control the results. And even though we are invited to play a bigger role in the process than what they were invited to play in, in Israel or Rome, if we can just remember that we don't control the results, but, but God does, I think that allows us to speak into deeply held values and to uphold those values, apart from politics even. Yeah. Um, and and to, to do so in such a way that is, is it's not, you know, all of the stakes of, of the world going forward in a just way, it doesn't all rely on us. We have a part to play, but, you know, like I said, the message, uh, if we can back up from this hyper-responsibility thing, thinking that if I don't do this, no one will, we can rest in the fact that a God is working things out. And that's not a call to irresponsibility or abdication, but there is this tender balance of I'm invested, I'm speaking about truth, I'm, I'm helping advance God's kingdom in the way that I know how, which means how people are treated, um, but I'm also not taking it too seriously, not thinking it's all on me, trusting that God is mm. at work in the bigger picture and lots of other people are too. 
Yeah, that's super important. Um, this question is, what does the Bible say about electing slash voting for a leader, i.e. president, when the choices don't align with most Christian values, or at least they appear not to hold the same values? Yeah, I think this is what makes voting so hard. Yeah. Um, when, when I first became a voter, um, it, was in the, it was in the 90s, and, um, and that was kind of also while, while the church was kind of really connected with a political party. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so for me, I was a faithful Christian, and it was kind of like, hey, these are the values that matter. And there was like a voting guide that said, like, you should care about these things, so vote for candidates who care about these things. And as I read through the scriptures, I was like, oh yeah, those are, those are things that God cares about. Um, as I've gone deeper into the scriptures, as I read through the scriptures over and over again, and this is why it's such a value to us that we have access to the scriptures and we can read them, I've realized that there are actually more things that God values than what I was told God valued in the 90s. There are all kinds of faith values that really should drive who I vote for. So that's one side of it. I've got to do the work to understand what does God call me to love? What does God call me to value? And there are a lot of things. Some of those are things that directly play out in politics. Some of those are just things that play out in my own personal life. But, I, but part of my job as a Christian is to let God's heart become my heart, his values become my values, and that's hard enough. Then you take that thing going on inside of me, and then I'm trying to put that onto people out there in the field, candidates, none of whom, none of whom, none of whom reflect all of God's values. Um, you know, the, the most faithful Christian is not gonna reflect all of God's values. It's just impossible for us to do. So we have to do this natural picking and choosing, looking at imperfect people who don't completely align with the heart of God to say, what do I believe is most important? Where, where is God leading me to, to put my, my, my vote? And um, beyond just moral values, there are also kinds of other good economic values and, and there are things that really don't have anything to do with morality. There, there are questions of economics and yeah, there might be some justice questions in economics, but there's also just you know, what, what works economically. And so there's this whole other realm of things that is, um, is not even necessarily faith driven. So that's what makes it so hard. What I would just say is, this is what makes our job as Christians really hard in a democracy. Um, that we, we are called to first inform ourselves with the heart of God fully, not take the easy way out and just listen to someone else's word for it, but to really acquaint ourselves with what is in the heart of God. Who, what does God care about? God, and I mean, this, I pray this all the time in life, just in life. God, make, make my heart your heart. I wanna, I wanna love the things that you love. I wanna hate the things that you hate. I, I just really want my heart to be yours. And then we've gotta figure out with a bunch of imperfect people, got different agendas, where do I put that? Yeah. And that's, I think there's humility with all of this, that I'm going to do the best, I'm going to vote for the best person I think is out there, and John, you may vote for someone else, and I've got to respect that because it's a really hard thing for us to do, but man, humility, humility, humility in the household of faith as we deal with each other on these matters would get us pretty far. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate the, your own, learning your own position, but realizing that everyone else is also doing the exact same thing. Right. So this question is... Um, about just faith in action. So when should our faith move us to action in what ways, you know, against, against political injustice? So how do, we, how do we know when to go to action? Yeah, I mean, my faith moves me to action in everything that I do. Um, I think the specific way in which I take action is the big question mark. Um, so I think a good guideline for us is, yes, my faith should inform my actions, but are my actions actually helpful? Are they productive? Um, I wrestle with this a lot. I mean, I've, I've, got, a, I've got a small platform here. Um, I've got a, you know, probably a few thousand people max who will listen to what I have to say on a weekend. That's a relatively small platform. And so sometimes when I, when I feel like uh, you know, tempted to use my platform to you know, work against political injustice, I just ask a really humbling question. What does my voice actually matter in this issue? What, what can I actually do? And I find for me, more often, what I think is the, mo- the best way for me to take action is not, and this is just my, my personal conviction, maybe God will lead you to a different conclusion, it's not to make a bunch of noise about what I believe, it really is to live out my faith in tangible ways in my community. So if I'm upset, and, and I am upset, 
with the way that our nation is still struggling to heal from you know, generations of, of racism and all that slavery has brought. And uh, I, you know, I get upset when I see how you know, the distrust between communities of people and uh, that upsets me. I realize the, the best thing that I can do, and this, this is how my faith drives my action, is I can become a bridge builder in my own life. I can reach out to people who've had a different experience. I can learn from their stories. I can love them. I can just, I, I can be a little model of what I hope will happen on the grander stage. I can, I can bring more harmony and bridge building and love and care to my relationships with people who are of a different race or of a different experience. Um, so first and foremost, I think we have to ask the question, what action is actually going to be the most transformative? And even in a democracy, I think we all overestimate the power that our voice has. We've been told since we were kids, you know, your voice has power, your voice has power. And it does have some power, but I think there are other actions that we can take that are actually more powerful. And, and if I could just go back to the, to the ancient church for a minute, the early church had no power. Christianity was an illegal religion. Their voice was not heard. But the power of the Christian influence was that they were a community of people who lived differently and they looked differently. And so the Christian church was the one place in all of the world, as I said in the message, where Jew and Greek could come together. And I mean, those were hugely different groups of people. They did not get along anywhere in society. There was nowhere where Jews and Greeks intermixed or slaves and free people, or men and women even. I mean, just division after division. The Christian church was the one place that looked different. And people just kind of scratch their heads looking at the Christian church going, wait a minute, there, there are Jews and Greeks and slave and free and men and women. And how can this be? And that was the thing that really started to change the world. They did not have any political power. And we think too much of power and power and power. Power is going to change the world. It was, it was loving witness. It was the power of the gospel. It was demonstrating a way to be different. So for me in my life, the action that I continually feel compelled to take when I see political injustice is how can I live justly in my relationships? And how can I be one place in the world, my family, my community, be one place in the world where people look and they go, oh, this is broken, but there's something different going on there. And that was the influence of the early church that eventually changed the world. I still believe that's our influence, even though we also have been given a voice in, in government. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. It was an extended answer, but I think it was really needed. And hey, we got a few more texts in kind of last minute. I see you. Um, we, we have a podcast on Tuesdays where we'll kind of bring these questions back up. Um, so check that out, Pathfinder Unscripted. It, it airs on Tuesdays at like 3.30-ish. Yep. Um, so if this message was helpful, if the Q&A was helpful, please share it. We have a YouTube page where you can, you can share the recording of this with family members or friends that you feel like uh, could, could use it, but uh, appreciate the questions and thanks again. Yeah, and uh, just, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pile on here for one second. Um, you know, for, for me, and especially in a political season, I just wanna caution everybody, there's only so much that I can give my voice to as a person without losing credibility. And I think one of the things we have to decide when we're dealing with any of these issues is wh where is my voice most needed? What issue, what cause matters the most for me. And for me as a pastor, me as a Christian, even before I'm a pastor, you know, if I stop being a pastor someday, for me as a Christian, this will be true that the thing that I want my voice to count for is I want people to know the love of Jesus above all, because that's the only thing that, that ultimately matters. That's the thing that changes people's hearts. That's what has changed societies and will continue to change societies. And so for me, I think we all have to pick and choose where do I want to use my voice and where do I want to save my voice? You know, so if I'm talking about everything under the sun, I'm gonna, tune, I'm gonna turn people away and people are gonna tune me out. I've only got so much voice to give. I sound like uh, the star is born or something, right? That's what he says to her in the star is born. I've only got so much I can use my voice for. What am I gonna use it for? And I hope as Christians, you wrestle with that question seriously because I, I believe for all of us, the thing that is most important for us to use our voice for is to tell the world about a God who loves them so much that he gave his son for them. A God who's calling them into something richer and deeper. And, and I hope as a church that we can begin to save our voice and use our voice first and foremost for that. And we're thoughtful and sparing in all the other things, even the things that we're passionate about. And I know I'm passionate about so many things, but I constantly have to go, what matters most? What do I want my voice to count for? And I just encourage you to do the same. In fact, I wanna pray for that for us. God in heaven, First of all, I thank you that in everything in this creation, 
that you created. And I, I just think about this weekend, I think about the trees and the sky and the grass and the hills. God, I'm humbled and I'm in awe on the fact that your image is found not on the trees or the hills or the sky or the grass. It's found first and foremost on me. I bear your image and your inscription and, and we do sitting here in this place today. God, allow that to both fill us with a sense of gratitude, but also humble us. Knowing that's a designation we do not deserve. So may we steward that well, God, show us how to do that. As we bear the weight of figuring out how to live out our faith in a changing world, and then how to be good citizens too, and how to use our voice in a political process that is meant to bring more justice into the world and not lose ourselves or not let Caesar have more than his due. And God, I pray that you'd guide each of us. Inform our hearts with your values. Give us wisdom as we go forward. Give us the guidance of your spirit so that when our lives and the sum total of our lives are put on display, our greatest contributions won't be for any cause other than the cause of Jesus' love and grace, his power and healing coming into the lives of many. But God, along the way, as we try to live out this difficult calling of first and foremost being ambassadors to King Jesus, but also being faithful citizens of our country, God, I, I crave your wisdom. And I pray that your church would, and, and I pray for your whole church, but I pray for Pathfinder Church, that we would begin to be a community that's different, that people would see us as a place that really does resemble your kingdom, that crosses divisions and, and lines and, and loves deeply and puts first things first. May we be different here in this church. I pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey everyone, I'm Tim Ryman. I'm the worship director here at Pathfinder Church. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's service. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss any of the content that we're pushing out all the time. Also, share this service if it was impactful for, for you, if it blessed you uh, on social media. Thank you so much and may God bless you.